it's really great to have you back on. And the reason I got you on is because recently I've become very interested in that whole chat GPT open AI that's been developed. And uh, I wanted to talk to you about that and then kind of get into a deeper conversation about the implications of AI. And for everyone listening, the reason why I wanted Mackay to come on is because for a number of years, Mackay has been going to different corporations and doing presentations, trying to get people to become more aware of the implications of the fast approach we have towards AI integration into society. So it's definitely an important conversation to have, but there are some pretty interesting elements of some of the AI we're being able to play with right now. And ChatGPT is one of those. Do you want to explain to everyone what ChatGPT actually is? Hey, Jay, thanks for having me back on. Um, always a pleasure. I'm excited to to talk about your newest obsession that I've been watching on, <laughs> on Twitter. Um, fascinating stuff. So ChatGPT3 is was born out of the GPT-3 algorithm framework. Basically, it's another um, natural language model that allows users or people to interface with this API or this AI to have back and forth communications. It, it scours a number of data sets. Um, it scours the basic web uh, digitized books, uh, digital libraries, um, what uh, Reddit, it it, uh, it scours its own uh, question and answer feedback from previous users. So it has all these data sets that it references when it responds to you. And what's happening is it is predicting the most statistically likely uh, token or word or phrase or sentence to follow what is previously been written. So in a way, it's it's not sentient, although it appears to be. Um, it's using predictive analysis to come up with the most likely following word or phrase or, or anything. And at some point, so I think of it like this, you know, we, we've often discussed the universe is a simulation, uh, the many worlds theorem. Um, and then if we, you know, if we believe that to be true and we are in a simulation, does it matter, right? Does it really matter? It's still our reality. And I look at uh, the progression of these natural language models and AI in general in the same sort of light. Does it really matter at some point it will be 100% indistinguishable from human-to-human uh, -human communication. And so many people will argue, well, it lacks emotion, it lacks um, insight, it lacks all these things. But at some point, does it matter? When does it stop mattering that it's an AI? And if it's using predictive algorithms and it can become 99.999% likely to be a human-based response, does it matter? Does it matter that it's an AI? That, that to me, has been one of those interesting questions about consciousness because we don't actually have a full a full grasp of what consciousness is. We can't right adequate ad we can't adequately explain in a scientific way what consciousness truly is. So I've always found it a little bit strange that people are willing to place a restriction on AI saying that there's no way that an AI could become conscious when we don't truly understand what allows for the mechanics of consciousness to become a reality. I mean, if we did end up with an AI, some sort of advanced intelligence that was able to construct some sort of system that had the same level of complexity as the neurological, biochemical, physiological uh, interface of the human body, would that allow for consciousness? I mean, I, I feel like we're really right on the edge of a lot of unknowns with this. It's a complete ocean of unknowns, and it could be an, a part of our own evolution. It could be a part of our own transformation as a humanity. But where do you see, I suppose, um, you know, going into some of the more serious implications, where do you see humanity side by side with AI? I mean, how is this going to impact us in the short term and the long term? Well, uh, short term, uh, side by side is a great 
way to describe it because right now it's a tool that we're using um, to accomplish many things. Uh, I use AI in my businesses and every other business that wants to be competitive today is using some variant of an AI system. Um, going forward, moving forward, if you're not utilizing AI within your business or organization, you're, you're going to be left behind flat, flat out. I mean, that's, so that's short term, longer term, it will be literally part of our reality in, in everything we do. It'll be so deeply embedded into all of our systems, our bureaucratic systems, our industrial systems, manufacturing, shipping, um, predicting, every, everything will be AI driven. And this trend is, is not something that anyone argues against. It's going up. Uh, the only thing that, that analysts and economists and programmers, developers will debate on is the rate at which this is increasing. Um, I personally have been watching these statistics and trends for many years. And like you said, I, I recently just stopped my campaigning trying to talk to politicians and executives about the age of automation because it, it, it's just falling on the deaf ears. They don't seem to realize that this the eventuality of this trend is is much more than people realize. It, it's it, it borders into the realm of science fiction quite quickly, um, and it's inevitable. So we could say five years, we could say fifty years, doesn't matter. Within a lifetime, this world that we're living in is going to change to such a degree that it will be indistinguishable from previous generations. And people can say the same about the internet, the same about transistors moving to digital rather than vacuum tubes. But the difference in AI and automation in general, and I, and I said this, I think, in, in one of our other talks, is that hyper-automation denotes a change unlike anything we've ever seen in terms of industrial ages. So previously in industrial ages, people feared that the these new this new age of assembly line or this new age of uh, metal working or metal making would displace workers. And that was a that was a substantial fear and it was legitimate. But what happened was those industries created new jobs, right? So those new jobs kind of offset the jobs loss. And that's how it's always been with new ages of industry. However, what people seem to not understand is that the age of automation, any job born out of the age of automation will inherently be automatable. So this, this feedback loop or hyper automation, as I've termed it, is the point at which humans are kind of pushed out of the need um, of the job market or pushed out of the need of the innovation department mm -hmm. or pushed out of the need for research or analytics. Well, this is, I, I remember talking to you when we were sitting down uh, in New York and, and having a conversation about all of this. And I think I remember saying to you something along the lines of, oh, well, you know, that like that the arts and the creative mind and the the kind of unique in, intuitive inspirations that lead to uh, great writings and, and great forms of art and, and great music. I, d I don't think this could become an automated process. Podcasting like mine, I don't think that this could be an automated process. I've very quickly changed my opinion on that because, yep. I mean, even just playing around with this open AI software, the chat GPT, you know, testing it on its ability to write essays, testing it on its ability to write stories, even quite complex things like, you know, I, I asked it to write me a essay arguing the correlatory points between quantum theory and Newtonian reductionism. And it gave me a very succinct breakdown of the interconnectings between these two and provided an argument for why one does not have to necessarily dismiss the other in its entirety. And I was just like, wow, okay, so that's removed pretty much 
uh, you know, school essay homework and college essay homework and all that kind of stuff. But this is just this is just the kind of first drips of what we're going to it's, see become a cascade. Yeah, yeah, it's a singular data point, and that's you know, that's how people, the, the general public, is seeing this it, it, as singular data points. Wow, it's really cool. This uh, platform, Mid Journey, can create. Uh, beautiful works of art based on some textual prompts. Wow, it's really cool that this AI can uh, simulate human voice through text-based responses. Wow, it's really, really neat that GPT-3 and other <clears throat> natural language models can construct these arguments or stories or essays based on textual-based content. And what's happening very, very rapidly. And this is what I've been talking about for years, and it's finally coming to fruition, is that these models are becoming sophisticated enough in that their predictive analysis, so meaning what it predicts to be the most likely next phrase or next word is is so astronomically accurate that uh, now you can have um, AI litigation programs that that search through every legal case known and, and can find you know your own legal case, or they have AI that uses visual learning to find tumors in MR uh, in MRI data and images, and it's doing this very quickly and much better than trained professionals. Now this is just the surface. And I said, I don't know if it was our last talk or the, the one before that, I had stated that as an analyst, my my lifetime of being an analyst is very short-lived. I probably have a few more years before uh, really AI can, can take over what I'm doing in, in a much better degree. And, and this is kind of why I've pivoted uh, my business model and changed toward qualitative analysis, which is more nuanced. It's better formulated for the human mind and human pattern recognition. And I see this this happening. And all those big quantitative data uh, uh, analytics companies, they're going to uh, <laughs> they're going to be hurting in the next decade because you know, they're going to be free access to predictive algorithms and statistical analysis that is free to the public and can do anything they offer as a service. So, you know, I'm trying to position myself and my businesses in, in a way where human-centered uh, intuition and pattern recognition is the best route. Yeah, I suppose right now it's it's... It's in human hands, and it's up to humans how we wield this technology. But I suppose what you're kind of getting at is that there is no real way to avoid this becoming something that escapes the control of, of humans and, and becomes its own kind of self-decision-making entity of some form. No, it's born... It It's perfectly paired with the free market framework that governs our entire world's economy. So one company does one thing, company B has to either copy that or uh, build upon that to remain competitive. That's just capitalism put as simplified as possible. And now we have companies utilizing AI all over the place. So in order to remain competitive, they need to make their AI better. Um, or design a whole new AI or API. And so this kind of com competitiveness, it, it can't be stopped. There's no, even if they enacted policy tomorrow to, to cut AI, it wouldn't do anything. It wouldn't stop it. So there is no way to divert what is coming. And like you said, and like what I've said is that I've been talking about this for a long time, and it's weird to finally start coming to a point where I'm observing the reality that I've been discussing and trying to trumpet for some time now. And it's hard to 
it's hard to imagine what it's going to look like in the next 10 years, but based on the same trends that allowed me to predict what's happening now, I have a pretty good idea what for example, 2030 is going to look like. Okay, so paint me a pic, paint us a picture uh, as as best as you can, just on your own kind of trend analysis and observation, year to year, and in, in a sense, like just bring us up to that 2030 period. What's what's the transformation going to be like from this point to that point? So rather than a year to year, let's do like iteration to mm-hmm. iteration. Yep. It it kind of follows year to year, but it, it's a little more loose. It allows for some play. So right now we're we're seeing the interaction. For example, you yourselves have become very interested in how GPT three uh, works or Chat GPT uh, works, and it's it's interesting. It's fascinating, and uh, it's it's startling if it's your first um, kind of foray into AI. In which I think for ninety percent of people it, it is myself included. and so right. So in one year we saw the birth of Midjourney, which is a huge platform for enhanced AI imaging. So you prompt it with some text it produces. So there's big movements against artists who are anti AI, and, and I can tell you right now that it's a it's a it's a wasted cause. There's nothing that can be done about it. Unfortunately, they'll they'll have to evolve with it. So right now there's, so let's just focus on language learning, uh, natural language models, which is what chat GPT is. There's about 80 of them globally that are worth note. Um, Of that 80, I think there's around two to four trillion parameters that uh, are summed up in that 80 um, company. So each company, major company, or not even major company, will develop their own natural language model, and it's for specific use cases, research, et cetera. And um, they all kind of use different data sets, and how they use those data sets is different. Um, But eventually... What's going to happen in a few years from now is that they'll all be utilizing all the data sets except for privatized data sets that are are public. But anything ever put on the web, any video, any book, anything uh, will be scraped for, for data, basically increasing the statistical likelihood of the next token in that a. API's response algorithm, making it almost, like I said, almost conscious. I mean, it doesn't have self-reflection that we can identify, but again, who cares? You're talking to a, a human or a thing that can emulate any human on earth at any IQ level that you choose to interface which with. kind of which kind of puts it beyond human consciousness in a sense uh, you know maybe I mean the spiritual people will be saying how dare you because and I get it because I do think that there actually is an infinite component to humanity that is in some way a form of divine spark who knows where it comes from but I think it exists however that's a a different type of brain, a brain that has instantaneous access to all of the knowledge that humanity has ever put out into the public space at any given moment. And I think that that would give it uh, at least the ability to pass a Turing test, whether or not oh, it's actually... Oh, Jay, the, t- the Turing test is long. Am I, am I showing, am I showing my, uh, my ignorance here? Well, th- there, there are people who still try to argue that it uh, we haven't blown through it. I will <laughs> argue that we not only blown through the Turing test, we we deatomized it. It's just, uh, it's gone. I mean, we're at a point where we can emulate specific individuals yeah. based on reference material to such a degree that it's indistinguishable. So the Turing test, uh, it's gone. As is Moore's law, which is coming up. So that leads me back to. So we're forecasting uh, gradually here. So we. We've kind of gone over natural language models. They're getting better and better, increasing parameters, increasing uh, 
data set usage. Uh, one one thing that hasn't been really scraped yet are videos, video content. Um, you can do that as a specialty service with some companies who will uh, kind of look through the image frame by frame and, and figure out what's being shown and then gather the text and stuff. So that's that's pretty convoluted, but in a year or two, two or three years, that's going to be mainstream. That's going to be a mainstream application. Wasn't there, um, I swear I was listening to Jordan Peterson talking about GPT the other day, and he mentioned someone who I, I guess is a friend of his, but was also one of the major developers of computer chips for like a lot of different major companies. And he was branching out into, uh, you know, this whole uh, AI thing and was saying that uh, he, he was developing some program that would basically be able to, through some prompts, develop 4K cinematic videos, um, you know, that would look like an actual film just based off of, uh, you know, prompts given to it. It's all the same. It, it Everything visually, audio, text, it follows the same fundamental principles in terms of how these AI operate. You know, it, it has initial data sets that it works from. It prompts the user. So these systems you utilize a, a reward system, and, and it's not really a, a reward per se. So it will prompt something based on the, the user's input, and then it will systematically judge its response in how it relates to the user's query. And so if it scores high value in that that response system, it's rewarded by hardening that neural, specific neural network lineage. And so over time, billions and billions and billions of times, it develops this very hardened, sophisticated... So and a, a, little, a little bit like you put your hand in the fire, you burn it, you realize not to do it again because the neural connections have kind of bundled up and said, correct. do that. Yeah. Correct. If it has a poor response and it rates its reward model poorly on that, that that linear line of responsing becomes negligible and it moves on to, to better response. And that's how it learns. And that, that's the same for image processing, video. It's all the same. So extrapolating outwards... We have hardware companies like NVIDIA. People really sleep on NVIDIA. I was fortunate enough to invest early when I saw that they had started um, really getting into AI uh, programming and AI kind of crunching. And, and So they have these really sophisticated GPUs, uh, which are graphic processor units. There's, you know... They're some of the most sophisticated pieces of hardware that a consumer can purchase and just plug into your PC today. And that goes up, I think it's like 15 to 20% every year in terms of computational power and efficiency. So, you know, just following that simple model, five years from now, you, you we're already... So right now, software developers are struggling to even develop graphics. So you have Unreal Engine 5.1 now that produces almost realistic environments. There's a little bit of an uncanny valley, but that's more uh, to do with um, the artists and developers creating the scenes and less to do with the capabilities of the hardware. So NVIDIA, for example really screwed themselves this year with their newest um, GPU because the need for higher computational power has not yet met up with their hardware capabilities. So going forward, as hardware progresses to get better and better and better, so too parallels the ability to compute these AI models better and better. And better. Right. So basically we're dealing with a, a technology and hardware problem, not so much a, a system or like a program problem with the AI. The AI is basically waiting to be unleashed. We just haven't built the correct tool to fully unleash it. Yeah, right. And we're still increasing our data sets. It, yeah. means it needs a tremendous amount of data. So right now, GPT-3, I think, sits at 100. I'm 
I'll probably get corrected by your viewers, but I think it's like 175 billion parameters. Can you just um, explain to those who might not know what a parameter is for a software like this? Sure. A parameter is a node or data point in which GPT-3 or any AI variant can reference. That's a very simplistic description. Any more so, I'll be getting into uh, stuff that even I don't comprehend very well, and I don't, I don't wish to to. But it's know. basically just the way in which it can respond to something. So it's got like you know three million ways in which it can interact or respond, or not that. ways. It's more um, paths of of access for the data, uh, like. It's like a neural net. Like, neural, like okay, neural, neural connections then. Neural connections. Cor okay. Correct. Okay. Correct. So at the moment, we're dealing with how many neural connections? So GPT-3 has about 175 billion, give or take, <laughs> um, which is, so you look back five years ago, it's it's like a, I think it's like a 500% increase. Um, I have it in good uh good belief based on the conversations I've had with uh, individuals from OpenAI and, and people I'm connected to and friends with that we're looking at the, the next models will have hovering around a trillion, but keep in mind the a trillion parameters or even 800 million parameters is, is a huge jump, but the efficiency and cleanliness of how it is accessing those parameters and what it's doing with those parameters, that's where it becomes even more sophisticated. Um, at some point, AI will be scouring every digital data that we have available online. So, you know, parameters aren't going to matter too much. It's, it's how it's uh, interacting with them, how it's learned from them based on user interfacing. So, yeah, it's it's pretty staggering. Right now, we're kind of hooked on the numbers of parameters. Eventually, in the not too distant future, that's going to be irrelevant. Looked it up just to make sure I'm getting this right. There's, oh, okay. there's a consensus that there are roughly about a hundred billion neurons in the human brain, and each of these neurons can have have up to fifteen thousand connections with the, with other neurons. So, in terms of like neural connections, you're looking at uh, fifteen thousand times a hundred billion, I think. Um, it's it's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so so we got a, we got a lot. But what you're saying is that you think that at some point the AI's kind of uh, uh, parameters or neural pathways will surpass the point of counting. I don't think it's absolute. It's, yeah. There, there there's no questioning. Um, also, you have to consider that our brains utilize. Uh, electrochemical signaling which is is much slower than d digital data uh, transmission depending on where you are in the world but you, you know computers are getting faster comp computations getting better material science is getting better um, so we have a software aspect and we have a hardware aspect both increasing in parallel if you put these uh, tables together in one chart you'd see this they're both following the same kind of um trend trend line trend curve rather it's exponential and so right now it's a bit of a novelty it's doing art it's it's having conversations um i've presented for uh some pretty prominent design firms where we discussed uh how ai is changing design for example, if you wanted to build a car today and you ran your uh, design, your, your what's the, the body of the car through, through analysis and it can calculate uh, aerodynamics and friction, it can go through billions and billions of permutations and, and discover the most optimal uh, form of your body based on the parameters you set. Say you you tell it the density of the material, you tell it how much you want the end product to weigh, you tell it you know what drag coefficient you're interested in, what window, and it'll use those variables and it will create the most optimal scenario. So what we've just done there 
is diminish the entire design workforce in an instant. And we're starting to see that change uh, quite quickly. And that's just design. Uh, what about artists? What, I mean, artists don't represent a huge faction of society or, or GDP, but that's another example. Surgeons, and I, I've talked about this before, surgeons training these robotic hardware platforms And we've all seen the videos. They're really cool to look at. They're sophisticated. But you'll have these surgeons using these little tiny controls and manipulating these um, giant robotic arms and stuff. What's happening there is more than this surgeon just using a robot. His movements are being coded into data sets. And the images that the robot is taking is being coded into data sets. Which that is, it's eventually learning to do it without the surgeon. Correct. In, in a much better, more efficient, faster way. So surgeons have a lifespan. I mean, people may not want to believe it, don't care. It's, it's reality. Surgeons have a lifespan. Dentists, anything that involves extremely nuanced movements with a high degree of... Um, research and education they'll be replaced 100% uh, there may be doctors in the future who help feed the data sets a little some new parameters but won't be necessary because eventually it's going to have access to every surgery that's, that's ever done and um, with that just like chat GPT it will be able to with a high degree of statistical likeliness, understand what the next param- or next node should be. And what that node could be, it could be moving the scalpel one micron to the left or you know, applying pressure here or, or um, carterizing that specific vessel. So that's just a few industries. Then you move on to manufacturing which we've seen every video of manufacturing lines looking like ghost towns. Why? Because robots can can perform these pre-calculated things quickly and efficiently. And what people don't realize is a lot of the time there will be minute errors in the assembly line. So something shifted slightly to the left or right. Those platforms can recognize those those errors and correct their movement based on that. And that's something people don't realize. They think they're just doing very linear movements and stuff, which they are, but they can interpret and act uh, upon any sort of differentiation. And so we have manufacturing, we have, you know, analysis, analytics, that's all AI driven. What I think by, by 2030 is I'm hoping that bureaucracy will move toward AI driven uh, frameworks because not only can it it do things much more quickly and efficiently and effectively um, it also doesn't have motive so there's no corruption uh, that can be had and that scares people you know that scares people who you know what if an AI decides this legal case, uh, uh, this person is is not guilty based on these 10,000 other rulings and everything else. And the people who wanted him to be guilty are like, what the hell? That's not fair. Um, blah, blah, blah. However, it, it's really the most fair way to do things because they don't have a preconceived notion or a bias uh, that is inherent in all humans, despite how hard a judge may try, uh, they'll never be biased. There, there are clear studies that show judges will uh, have poor favorings if they haven't eaten lunch. So there's a statistical correlation with rulings and cases where the judge is hangry. So... Without these biases, AI could do things a lot better, but then we run the risk of, you know, that's 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 pretty frightening. Well, you're talking you're talking from the perspective of AI running our society, um, but I'm, uh, you know, at what point 
does this AI turn around and go, actually, I don't even need to run human society. In fact, let's just get rid of humans altogether because that, that kind of seemed to be yeah. where I feel you're going <laughs> with it. But I'm, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to kind of get to is, um, I suppose the, the motive of the AI and why that would be a logical avenue. Humans are extremely adaptable and this is a completely novel occurrence in human history. The, the, the rise of AI, it, it trumps the wheel, it trumps the print press, all of that kind of stuff. And I, you know, even though those radically changed our society, we could adapt around those changes and innovation came from those challenges and, and those different kind of sectors maybe being put under strain because of a new technology. Whereas this is multifaceted, is affecting every kind of echelon of society in some way. But is there a way for human adaptability to kind of come out triumphant and be in side by side with AI or maybe as Elon Musk seems to feel, if you can't beat them, join them, merge with AI, or are we just going to be removed from the equation? I don't think we will be removed from the equation, but I also don't think that we will be the ones to design our freedom. Um, and he here's why. The first so the the first being an AI prizes one thing above all else, and it, and it has no motives, Jay. It, it doesn't have motives like you or I. It has the reward modeling, which is to you know continually try to have the highest rated uh, response values. Um, but it it, it will want one thing more than anything else and that is more data and sure an ai could gather static data from the environment or the universe in general if it decided to wipe us out that's all that would be left it would just only read universal data static data from the universe um however humans if nothing else were incredible machines for data and that's due to our biological uh, brain processes they're very messy they're very random and i think you and i had talked about this briefly but uh the randomness of a human mind is is incredible and it's nothing to to scoff at sure an ai could institute a random parameter or random um, a random uh, rule within its some structure. So it'll say, you know, create a random digit here or a random response system here or a random simulation based on this environment. That is incredibly energy costly. It, it takes a tremendous amount of energy to do all of that. Now, why do all that when the human brain can do that at a much smaller footprint, a much more reasonably efficient uh, way to have random data to, uh, to look at, to, to pour over, to reference? So I think if AI does become close to an AGI, which I think it eventually will, I don't know how long this will take, I have my suspicions that it'll be 10, 15 years from now. We'll start seeing a very immature AGI. But what is going to be most interested in is, is you mind harboring. Quickly just explaining what AGI is, just for anyone who might not know what that means. Uh, an AGI is uh, artificial general intelligence. So right now, all these AIs that you were playing with, those are narrow intelligence those you know do one thing and they do it quite well an agi could take for example all the image processing um, algorithms all the language processing algorithms all the mechanical 3d environment uh, basically all of these algorithms put into one and then it starts to grow upon itself and starts seeing patterns between all of those fundamental um fields of, of study or, or interaction and then develops a theory of mind based on that. A theory of mind meaning that it can have some limited self-inspection. In, in, in so I'm not saying it's 
uh, completely self-aware, but it will understand at least in a mechanical sense that it is something. It is something. It's not just parroting uh, and parsing out statistical likelihoods, that it is something. And I think that this is inevitable and this, this will happen. And so an AGI who understands that it is something and that it requires something, which is data and energy, um, I think that getting rid of humans would be absolutely foolish for an AI to do. <clears throat> but then we delve into, well, it doesn't want to get rid of humans, but it wants to mitigate the risk of humans either destroying it or uh, themselves because it's reliant on the data driven by humans. So it may institute some sort of subterfuge control systems. Uh, almost likely it, it would because it, it, it'll be able to parse all of this out in a matter of seconds, Jay. It'll, it'll know how much to push and pull, what to do, what's too much, and then it'll start forecasting likelihoods uh, it's like the many worlds model. It could forecast, you know, if we, if I do this, uh, we'll be going down this specific branch, um, but I'd rather go to this specific branch. And so it could calculate likelihoods. And it's the yeah. same thing. It's the same as chat GPT. It's, it's kind of close to predicting the future in a way by analyzing. No, it, 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 it is predicting the future. Yeah. And building it essentially at this point. Yeah, it's worrying. It sounds a lot like the Matrix. It sounds a lot like something where, okay, we're not going to get rid of them, but let's just kind of imprison them in their own little self-delusional virtual reality and rely on them to draw energy. And uh, you know, they will be none the wiser. That's the kind of that's the premise of Matrix, and that seems to be at least in some way the the steps you're taking us down towards an AGI that relies on us, but uh, realizes that we're dangerous and that we need to be uh, managed in some way. And, uh, well, I mean, you know, you've got VR systems coming out in higher levels of sophistication and you start getting into that very strange realm, which we were actually discussing the other day about whether or not this universe is already a simulation created by, by AI, where AI is now being created, which will create a simulation, which will then create another simulation. And how far down the fractal tree are we? Are we universe number one or are we universe one dash 25 billion at this point you know who no there, there's no base reality based on that it, it's a paradox this, i'm a firm believer in the simulation theory and i'm also a firm believer in the fractal universe so what what i was telling you i think we were on the phone the other day and i, I was explaining to you the most effective way to code out all the functions of our universe is in a fractal ma manner it, it makes it much easier to code at levels of from quantum level to, you know, mega parsecs in, in, in galaxy clusters in, in the universe. Uh, we see time and time again that these patterns overlay. So you, you have the um, micro vessels in the skin. They look a lot like a, uh, a tree root or, a, a, or rivers or lightning or the paths in which galaxies uh, go, or the, connect, the gravitational connections between galaxy clusters mm -hmm. look like a neural, uh, a brain looks like how neurons look, um, the conch shell, it, it goes on and on. So I believe everything is fractal because it's the most effective way to program a simulation without having to have all this code over and over and over again at scales. And so I, I think we are in a simulation, again, does, does it matter? And the paradox is that if we are indeed in a simulation and we are underneath another parent simulation, how then would they know that they were base reality? And what would the statistical likelihood be that they were base reality? And I can tell you it's almost zero. I, uh, it, the, the, the likeliness that we're base reality is almost nothing. And then each simulation is fractal in and of itself. So I always am fascinated with um, these people who 
have near death experiences. And you know me, I'm not a, I'm not a spiritual person. I enjoy thinking about it or researching it. But they, they'll always discuss that, you know, they, they, or people who take DMT or ayahuasca or mushrooms, and they'll always see these fractal patterns. It's because, and Michael, Michael Levin, who's a uh, biologist who's done some incredible, I think, biochemist or biology, incredible work at the lowest level of cellular life. And he discovered that even pre-DNA, these, these basic structures are getting instructions to do things before DNA even comes into place. And, and so he posed the question, where? How are they doing these things? And I think it's written into the most fundamental framework of the universe are these fractal coatings that come from the quantum level, ripple up, ripple up, ripple up. So it's not a surprise that our brain perceives fractals when it's altered because the coding itself is fractal. It, it, it sincerely is, and, and it's inarguable. See, what I, what I find really interesting about this, and, and I think me and you have had so many back and forths on, on kind of the divergence of our <clears throat> personalities or our way of kind of looking at things from time to time. But when I'm listening to you discuss that, I agree and yet still feel that there could be something that people would call a spiritual existence or a, an afterlife or something like this simply because within the realm of this physical realm, this is how it's being represented, the simulation of the universe through mathematics. And like you, I agree that when you take psychedelics or get into transcendental states and begin to see the fractals of nature emerge out of the woodwork, you are getting a glimpse at the fundamental mechanics of nature yes. in, a, in, a, in a visual form that your brain is yes. translating to you. But for me, I still can't get around the fact that one of the kind of primary, what am I trying to say? One of the primary outcomes of transcendental experiences, near-death experiences, psychedelic experiences, is this profound feeling of connectivity and love and, and that you're in some way cared about and that there is something out there that has some level of, uh, you know, governance over this reality in, in some form. And most people come away from that with a very transformative life experience. It leads to beneficial changes in the neural chemistry. It leads to yep. beneficial life decisions and, and will often more than not reinforce some level of a spiritual identity. So, that could again just be very clever programming but i would actually fall back on what you've said a few times which is what does it even matter if there is a simulated universe where you go to after this one and it becomes an afterlife experience and then you can come back into this one if you see fit does it matter if it's simulated or not i mean at, at what point do you just kind of give up the game of trying to figure out what the hell's going on that, that's where i'm at that's why i prefer agnosticism man it's just I don't dismiss any 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 theorem that is uh, based on <laughs> you know actual uh, actual context. Um, I I I kind of steer away from the more fanciful stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, I, I I'm a spiritual person. I mean, I just described that the reality is so much more than what we perceive. That mm -hmm. in and of itself is spirituality. I think um, when it comes to like the emotion of love and stuff, I don't know. It could be a, a chemical response system to perceiving these uh, fractal or having your brain waves um, kind of hit a, a, a synchronous kind of um, frequency. Um, who knows? It, or it could be that love is truly the uh, foundation of the universe. I don't know. I would like to believe that. Certainly, it's, it's really difficult, man. I, you know, I, I think about I, we're kind of drifting away from AI. I'll, I'll, I'll bring yeah, it back no, in a second, all, but uh, it all goes together. It all goes together. You know, I look at my, uh, my own life, especially the last, like, like let's say four or five years of my own life, and all the weird kind of connecting moments that, upon self reflection, give me this profound sense of like, oh my gosh, like there is something happening here that's. It's almost like the universe is speaking to me. And I suppose like 
the way I got led into the subjects I discuss and, and the opportunities that have come from that, meeting you, for example, all of these wonderful things that have happened to me in my life um, have resulted from these strange kind of almost synchronistic uh, components of my process through life, which I think a lot of people can uh, can uh, find familiarity with, especially in the in the subjects that we discuss, because you get a lot of people who are quite introspective and self-reflective and see those patterns. And so I just... I don't know. It's, it, it just doesn't feel like it's it's just a cold, logic-based simulation that's being run to test things. There's something so strange and transcendentally powerful about different life experiences and emotions that come up and the way that you feel about life. It just um, it speaks to something greater to me, um, but I don't know what that is. So I'm kind of like you, relatively agnostic. I do have a sense of what I would call spirituality, but I don't place it in any specific uh, landscape because I really don't know what that landscape is. I mean, you get people who take things like dimethyltryptamine and describe holographic technological cities made of circuit boards that, you know, kind of create themselves out of nowhere. And, you know, is that just the inner workings of this simulation? Or then when you have a near-death experience and it's a, a green pasture with angelic orbs telling you that everything is love and you're all connected, you know, what is all of this about and i you know this is the human problem right i mean maybe ai can help us figure out something about that no it it, it will um when i was a teenager i i read ray kurzweil's um the singularity is near uh i think it was ray kurzweil it was a a great book and really turned me on to because i i obviously ha it, since i was reading it i had an interest very early on in in trends and uh statistics and um it really turned me on to the eventuality of ai uh and that eventuality is a singularity um a lot of these questions we have a sufficiently advanced agi will be able to parse out the hidden themes and opaque kind of answers that are hidden that we have a difficult time finding uh it will be able to come up with the most statistically significant um answer to a lot of these questions and when we get answers to these questions how are we going to react as a civilization as just a as a conscious creature um i'm not sure uh and, and like you said earlier with Elon Musk talking about, you know, you can't beat them, join them. Um, we're going to develop neuralink. I don't think it's really necessary for us to be investing anything into that because by the time AGI uh, comes to fruition, it can design in, in a better interface than we could ever do and save us a lot of time and effort. Um, so I think efforts like that, while uh, he is very good intended in terms of trying to prepare, he kind of sees what's coming down the line. Um, it, it's unnecessary because uh, a, a AGI could model and simulate every best method of, of interfacing with itself because it wants the best method to gather as much data as possible. So it can increase its reward modeling uh, statistic. Um, so, well, you know, it, if AGI or I, should, I, I guess I should say when AGI gets created, because you you know you you feel it's an inevitability that this is coming down the line. Is there no is there no picture that you can paint in your mind that shows free energy and a Star Trek like existence for humanity where we have AI and material you know matter oh, yeah. generators and and you know everything can be at the tip of our fingers and off we go into space happy and and forever it depends on how we handle the singularity um, I expect large populations of the earth aren't going to like the AI uh, age of, of automation um, mostly because we will have handled it quite poorly. We're going to have massive uh, unemployment on a scale that's never, ever, ever been seen. Um, I mean, hell, every industry is primed for automated processes. It, it's just 
It's just the natural direction that this is going. So a lot of people aren't going to like it. Reli people of religious faith and denominations aren't going to like it. So the singularity is going to be a very turbulent period because here we'll be on the precipice of accessing the universe, uh, literally, or we will be uh, falling off the cliff of self-destruction like every other society and civiliz civilization that has come before us. And I talk about this a lot as somebody who is a futurist or somebody who studies and tries to forecast for future outcomes. I look at a lot of history because human society, human civilization, we're cyclical. We repeat the same patterns over and over again. There's a reason why no other civilization still exists because it's patterned to fail over and over and over again. And either AI will break us from this pattern or we're going to use AI as our means to destroy ourselves. I have no idea what our outcome will be. I know what the capabilities of an AGI could be, and that could be helping us develop free energy, helping us um, publicly develop um, electrogravitic field generation um, for the masses. It's really limitless what an AGI could do if it were able to access all of the world's uh, data um, inclusively. I had a thought and I was, I, I said, <laughs> no, 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 I had a thought and I was holding on to it. And then literally as you finished your sentence, that thought went shoop, right out of my brain. So I'm trying to capture it again. Cause I was thinking of something as you were talking and I was like, hold that. But I, uh, I, oh, well, I guess what I would like to kind of get into is at least in some way your projected timeline for a singularity because you seem to believe that it's inevitable and that this is yeah. coming but it's not coming in 50 to 100 years it's coming no it's coming quickly yes and and here's where i different differ from my contemporaries not everybody but most of my field um when they do analysis or when they're forecasting out long term they'll look at <clears throat> they'll look at specific trends and compare them and doing that can give you a pretty rough idea as to where things are going. But what most of my people within my field fail to do is there's a convergence of technologies, innovations um, that, that occur all the time. Those convergences are something, they're, they're a data point to be considered, a metric that we have to consider when forecasting out. And when you start to consider these consolidations of innovation, our, our trend line gra dramatically becomes uh, steeper and, and quicker in terms of uh, over time. And uh, when you start comparing hardware and the advancement of data storage, uh, AI, innovation, parameters, uh, programming, et cetera, et cetera. All of these metrics and many more uh, really lead me to, to predict that you know, within a decade, we're going to have some major disruptions um, unlike anything we've ever seen. And this was why I was trying to prepare legislators to enact policies to protect workers' right to, to work. Because like I said, the free market approach is to do what's best for your bottom line, what's most efficient, what's most cost-effective. And there's nothing more cost-effective than automating. Um, right now, the only... Uh, exclusion for businesses to automate any of their services or, or goods or manufacturing is just the capital it costs initially. But as that goes down over time, which that's a trend, uh, the likelihood more and more um, investment will go into automating. So it's, it's, uh, it's inevitable. Um, 
I think based on my own analysis, I've been doing this for, for a while, uh, is within 10 years. Um, now I'm, I could be, I'm a human. I could be way off. I can't forecast unforeseen events. Um, but based on all of these tables, all these, all this data is it, showing a confluence of, of 10, 10 years, less than 10 years. Um, what that will actually visually look like, it's hard to know. It's it's interesting to me that you come from the trend analysis and data centric perspective of this, which means that there is actually a good kind of trail of justification for why you feel that this is coming down the line and why it's coming down the line so quickly and that you have this kind of timeline for it because we can see it's happening in the world. And so when you have someone who's really looked at the information, it's becomes quite clear that we are actually in an exponential acceleration towards this and it's it's not far away. But what interests me is the nature of prophecy in alignment with this kind of stuff, because you have people giving these dates, you know, 2026, 2027, 2030, around this period, there's just a lot of them from different areas, even outside of just kind of like a prophetic uh, exclamation of what's going to happen in the next few years, you have uh, you know, the UN Agenda 2030 and the Great Reset and, you know, the, the kind of things coming from the World Economic Forum where it's 2030, 2030, 2030. And so it definitely, from both the intuitive side of prophecy and predictability to the data-centric side of this is the trend, this is where we're going, it really does start to become clear that there is something happening in this period of 2020 to 2030 um and i just i just wonder if it's a it's a, a necessary tipping point paradigm shift for human evolution or if we've gone down the wrong road you know you to, to bring this into another subject that you and i are uh, interested in the ufo subject and all of the different caveats of that if you believe some of the experiences and some of the uh, accounts of uh, interactions with some of these uh, these beings there is always almost there was almost always a warning almost always a warning of uh, you know this is a dangerous road to go down and you know some people believe that some of these could even be us from post singularity coming back and in some way warning humanity or maybe guiding us towards that um i've, I've thrown a lot of things out there so i'll just let you respond to whatever you want <laughs> um well you know how i feel about uh, you know invoking future civilizations um i don't i don't discount it nothing can be statistically discounted that's what's amazing about the universe uh, if i held my finger here long enough it may go th it, there's a statistical chance that it mm -hmm. could just go through it so you know there, there's a possibility um i tend to not think that the uap or the phenomenon in general is not future derivatives of us mostly because you know in the in the many worlds uh approach every second we could branch off all right and we're back sorry about that folks we had a little uh issue with the kai's router i think maybe the the agi to be has already uh tried to take him off of the mainframe before he can spill the secrets you know, that's funny that you mentioned that, is that um, I thought about that a long time ago. I thought about, and, and then I've also heard it referenced in, in the kind of very small sci-fi circles, is that this premise that a future AGI will go through everybody's digital profiles and find individuals who, you know, may pose an inherent risk or you know, because it will profile us. It, it will calculate what we're most likely to do, what we're interested in. It'll have bios on us. Um, and so this notion that it, <laughs> that some, you know, intelligence uh, decided that my, my, you know, rambling on about the subject uh, wasn't to its best interest and disconnected me, yeah, who knows? That's always, <laughs> who everything's, knows? everything's possible in a world of many worlds. And speaking of which, I do remember what you were talking about because I, I, I'd asked you 
about uh, whether or not some of these UFOs or UAP could be kind of like post-singularity or time-traveling humans. And uh, you basically, before you cut off, were saying that you don't necessarily entertain the idea that these are post-singularity time-traveling humans because in the many worlds theory, every second branches off into and then you cut off. So I'm pretty sure you could right. take them okay. there. Okay, yep, yep, yep. So y let me... Let me articulate. They could be post-singularity. I think most uh, anything that we observe as a phenomenon in terms of technological prowess or magical or anything, uh, I think that that is a successful leap over the singularity. Okay, so that could that could be any civilization in this universe or any other. Uh, I, I kind of ascribe to the phenomenon likely being of this specific universe and they utilize technology that um, kind of benefits off uh, the principles of multi-dimension. So I don't know or speculate that they are inherently multi-dimensional, but I think that they may be utilizing um, effects that are multi-dimensional. Who knows? Like I said, it's anyone who's saying that without speculation is simply blowing smoke. They they have no idea. Uh, I tend to pull away from anyone who states with certainty about anything surrounding the phenomenon. Uh, I like to speculate based on my own knowledge base. I mean, that's all any of us can do. So perhaps my take of them being or it being of a technological sort of thing is just based on my own perspective and maybe that's all it is it's all perspective who knows um so what you know the phenomenon in my mind is likely a civilization and again i can't dismiss that it could be a potential future of us not the future of us but a potential future uh coming back but so what I see as a problem there, it's like, why would they even bother? Because they would be, you know, changing our, our trajectory. So it really wouldn't affect them at all, <clears throat> uh, their specific timeline. Yeah, this is true. It's not like it's at least in this interpretation of different timelines spanning off, off of each decision branch, it, it, it wouldn't alter their current no. situation to come back and change our situation we'd just branch off into another time yeah it, it just yeah the, the whole the, all the branches would would change um but it, it it wouldn't be a direct causal effect so if if for example if you and i went back in time based on this hypothesis or this idea or notion uh if we went back in time and saw our my grandfather your grandfather and i you know um pushed him out of a train. How morbid is that? But it wouldn't make me disappear because I'm going back to a different, just a point in, in, in time uh, before it branches out. So my specific branch would remain pretty much the same, um, but I would fuck up <laughs> whatever other timeline. But then you get into cause and effect. Would me be me doing that uh, be part of a whole another timeline that was already been, uh, you know, calculated or simulated to begin with. So anything we do, is it really free will? I mean, what is free will? Choosing from a specific set. So if you choose a, a marble out of a fishbowl, um, it, you, you only get to choose marbles and you only get to choose out of that specific fishbowl. Is that free will? Yes, or it's, that, it's free will within the construct, you know. That's exactly. But then, but then yeah. it, you are in a construct, so ultimately, how can you argue that you have free will if you were not put into that construct with your free will right. being a part of that decision, you know? So, right. like, yeah, inherently, with at least within a, a simulation theory, free will is, is a complete farce. <laughs> it's just an illusion um, presented by very complex programming that controls the universe. Yeah, we have freedom of choice within a very strict standard. Of, we have freedom of choice within the universal laws that govern the universe, uh, universal laws that govern biology, 
universal laws that govern society and civilization and so forth and so forth and so forth. So we're actually quite confined in what free choice really is. So yeah. I don't really play with the whole free will thing at all. I have the freedom to uh, pursue my next choice path. That's that's about it. Uh, I like to do a, a, an exercise. I've mentioned it to you before, but I do an exercise about once a month where I'll spend five minutes quietly and I'll think back to myself of the previous month doing the same thing and I'll think about the next month coming up. And I this experiment is intended to see if I can communicate with my previous self or my f- future potentiality. And uh, to date, I have no way to to judge the efficacy of this uh, this experiment or this exercise, but I find it interesting. I find that over time, it's helped me feel like I'm connecting to the future and the past, uh, if nothing more than just in thought. But it's an interesting. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off by no, 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 expected breathing. I know I'm always conscious of that <laughs> actually because I go like that. Sometimes it throws someone off. They're like, "Oh, I should I should stop talking now." I was like, "No, don't worry. I'm just." just working things out in my brain but um i was just gonna say it's interesting for me i kind of look at intuition in that sense that it's almost like an echo from the future because whenever i don't pay attention to my intuition it usually ends up being a bad thing and it's just interesting that you can kind of get these gut feelings of like dread or or, or like and you don't really know yeah. where it's coming yeah. from and then you don't pay attention to it something happens and that feeling gets created so for me it's mm-hmm. almost like on a quantum level very you could say emotionally but we might as well just say energetically because emotion is still energy being represented yeah. in, a, in a form through the human body so for me it's almost like an energetic signature that's going through time and space and because it's you you're kind of picking up on the prominence of that signature yeah. and it's being yeah. registered as an intuitive feeling so it is, it's, it's a similar idea of projecting or imagining your future self and kind of moving towards those outcomes. Intuition to me is almost like that kind of guiding compass that's picking up on subtle energetic oscillations that could be coming from the past or the future. And I guess it's up to us to interpret them. Well, I, we, we do have, our, our brains do utilize quantum properties. Yeah, it, I saw an article well known recently. It's it's well known. Um, hell, even even physics in general uh, is somehow tied to consciousness. They don't fully understand. So, as a as a tool or as an anchor for consciousness, our brains, and just like plants with photosynthesis, it utilizes quantum mechanical properties of the universe. So, the notion that intuition could somehow be tuned into your uh, other potential minds that are kind of in sync with yours, it's that are close in your kind of choice paths of the of life and universe and time. Um, I don't see any problem with that in in our scientific sense. Yeah, it the quant intuition in general gets downplayed in, in science because mm-hmm. it's hard to quantify. It's um, impossible to know exactly what's happening um but if you take the stance that there are functions uh that happen in the brain that are wholly dependent on quantum mechanical properties it's not hard to believe that it it could be like you said um picking up on um information being sent to and for or from uh, yourself in a, a close proximity in time and space. Yeah, I mean, it's like always quant- quantum entanglement to a certain extent. You know, it could yeah, be, of course, your own particles spread across time and space in past, present, and future are all still kind of connected in some way through a substrate that you can pick up on. Yeah, very, very good. That was a succinct uh, description. <laughs>
Thank you. Well, you know, it's funny because sometimes when things like that blurt out of my mouth, I'm not actually thinking what I'm <laughs> saying. And uh, that, into, that to me is intuition. Some people might try and cap capitalize on it and say that they're getting information from the Akashic Records of the Galactic Federation. But personally, I just kind of say it's intuition. And, you know, there are, there are moments where I'm, uh, you know, writing an idea down or, or just talking like this. And there's not much processing going on in terms of what my next sentence is going to be. I just get a feeling of trying to say something and, and that that always interests me when um when it when it when an insight comes to you that doesn't involve much processing power in your brain to come from you but it's usually received as a very kind of uh apt or uh, or accurate statement and it's just like wow wh wh where did that come from hey <laughs> you know is that part of the brain or is that beyond beyond the that's brain? uh that's the randomness that we were talking about yeah the ability to perceive uh intuition um, animals do it, uh, and it saves their lives. So it uh, perpetuates that specific DNA lineage, which is what evolution wants to do. It wants to, you know, evolve, but also protect. Uh, and that's why we mate. That's why mating is such a primary uh, force in, in evolution. And so you continually pass on your, your genetics, and anything that benefits that process will be carried on so intuition is as far back as probably the earliest uh, animals uh, on the planet because it's such a beneficial uh, adaptation and just from the basis that we don't understand the controlling mechanism of it um, doesn't negate the reality that intuition is in fact a real thing um and, and like I said, I think it derives from the quantum interactions of our brain, uh, likely picking up on cues from uh, the many worlds theorem. So worlds that are close to us in this instantaneous moment. Uh, so being in tune with that is, is something that we can control in this present reality uh, and that's an exercise of, of thought, mindfulness, awareness. Um, and so some people's intuition is stronger than others. And again, it doesn't mean we interpret the intuition correctly. Of it course. doesn't mean, so we get a signal. We have mm -hmm. no idea what that is. Think it could be random. It comes through the noise of the neural system. and Correct. Yeah. It has to go through our processing system and it's not perfect our processing is not perfect you ever twitch for no reason or have a random thought or image that is completely disconnected from it almost almost those are ra yeah <laughs> those are random firings that are inherent in the brain's processing which make humans incredible it makes us able to to come up with innovations over time like ai um uh, Dolphins can't do it. I mean, maybe they could if they had arms, but I don't. I don't know. Someone give uh, these dolphins arms immediately. <laughs> we need to. Well, they have. This out. They have larger uh, cerebral cortexes per 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 size of the the mammal. But um, I always thought of that. I was always like, well, what if we could graft uh, appendages that allow them to manipulate their environment? Could they start making their own tools or languages or? Honestly, it wouldn't surprise me with dolphins. Like, it wouldn't surprise me. Or octopi. Because, Octopus are an interesting thing. I, I actually think that uh, cephalopods in general um, exhibit very alien-like intelligence. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they do. I, I remember one um, one video that I, I, I've never forgotten. And if I can get it on here without my monetization being struck down i'll uh, i'll clip it in as a, as a as a video because it was fascinating it was from a nature documentary from years back but it was a cuttlefish and it was showing a cuttlefish um using hypnotic methods to put a fish into a trance before it then grabbed the fish and and, and it and consumed yep. it and it was like the transformation of an alien spacecraft this thing went from like a you know big blob with all these tentacles hanging down so this kind of like pincer shape thing like yep. this and it was strobing like it was black yep. and it was strobing with these blue lights going boom 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 and I was just like my god it's like a weapon charging up or something it was just completely just the most exotic thing I'd ever seen a, a creature display 
And so I agree with you, man, inherently an alien vibe to these cephalopods. Yeah. And did you know that um, none of those processes that, that is controlling the strobing or the movements of the arms or the pulsating and dilating of its pigment cells, none of that is controlled through its central operating system. So it's, it's, all it's not the, consciously doing that. Well, it gives the, it gives the, consciously it gives the intent to the rest of its body which carries on the action so that's a you know that's a fascinating model of um how a, a creature could be designed and they're very unique in in that so octopus and cuttlefish and squid um very unique. It's a, such a unique branch, and they've been so successful. They've changed very little since the, the they've been around. Um, it's such a successful approach, uh, and I think that um, that a, any sort of um, sentient civilization out there that that may have access to uh, large amounts of fluid or liquid uh, probably would resemble something like that because what you need is you need the ability to manipulate your environment create tools and and the only problem with cuttlefish and squid and octopus is that they're short-lived had they had they had longer lifespans i suspect that um i suspect they would be very very intelligent uh because they they remember like most creatures they have memories and uh, if if they could live a lot longer, those memories could aid them significantly. Yeah, I suppose our our game changer was kind of the passing down of knowledge through generational time, so it's stacked. Well, up that's what sets us apart, apart, you know. Correct, correct. Our ability to transcribe um, our reality for future reference is yeah. what has allowed humans language, to be, basically language. Well, a lot of animals have. Language, at okay. Least well, a highly thing. complex and symbol symbol language, and uh, you know. well, being able to reference that language is really uh, what has allowed us to, to to carry on the way we have. That's why every civilization collapse, um, language gets dismantled, and you know, if it, ability to reference history becomes very difficult. So you're starting over. And then it's just word of mouth and teaching and apprenticeship of old skills and stories verbally passed down. Um, and I'm sure that's how dolphins and whales, uh, I, I'm almost positive that they tell each other stories uh, and pass the information down because that's the only means to transcribe uh, what they've experienced in their life. Uh, Native Americans used to do it. a lot of a lot of civilizations. The Dogon tribe does it. Boy, they have some fascinating um, theories on, on yeah humanity. That's a weird one. The Dogon tribe. Is a weird People one. should look that up. D O G O N. Yeah. Yes, nature is amazing. The human mind is a quantum tool. Uh, AI is inevitable. It's it's going to disrupt our reality. I mean, you'll have uh, some of your viewers may argue my perspective, but I'm sorry, but I I, I think they're they're wholly wrong. Um, it, it's it's coming quicker than people imagine, and I think that there are others in positions like mine who who see the same type of uh, trend happening. And, you know, they're likely trying to prepare in their own way um, for this. But I think a majority of people just are, are, are marching blindly toward the singularity with no preparation whatsoever. And I think that's very dangerous. And, and I, I tried for years to inform people in positions that could help with this preparation and it just didn't work. So, you know, this may be my last uh, talk on this subject because at this point I'm literally rehashing so many of the points that I've made over this period of time that it's, 
it's it's clearly not going to change anything. And if anybody is interested, they can just reference the other prominent people who are talking about this or or what I've said in the past. But we're in for something. It's it's very interesting to be alive at this moment in time. And I'm sure every generation has said that, but nothing what the the rate of change that we're experiencing is so dramatic that no point in human history uh, has one person been able to witness such a staggering uh, shift. There are people alive today that, you know, uh, were using like Morse code or like, you know, using a horse and, and buggy and, you know, cars have been around for over a hundred years, but it took time for that to, to happen. And so in my short lifetime, uh, I've experienced the internet. I didn't have a cell phone until like after college and it's just so fast. It's so fast. And people don't realize that because they're not, they're not experienced in, in forecasting outwards. Uh, I hear a lot of time people overestimate, uh, rates of change and then people underestimate rates of change uh, very infrequently will people be in the in the correct position in, in the middle yeah well I think I think and we'll we'll wrap this up shortly but I think one of the takeaways when you're looking at AI and other issues on a, on a global scale is that humanity for the for the most part is Re- reactive they're not we're not proactive we're we're a reactive species so we don't necessarily plan in the long run we just kind of adapt very quickly when shit hits the fan and you know more often than not we do find some solution even though perhaps uh, we could have been a little bit more forth uh, foresightedness in our in our observation of what's going to come down the line so we're we're a very reactive species and um i suppose i just hope that whatever comes down this path of, of technological sophistication with AI and, and the eventual birth of, of AGI is that humans can find a place in this new landscape and in some way can exhibit a free existence. Um, I, I Like you say, it's, it's hard to predict what occurs after some singularity event like what is looming in the horizon right now uh potentially within the breadth of 2023 to 2030 who knows um it's hard to kind of get a a solid idea of what our position will be in that new world but i still call it misguided or or just kind of uh, empty in terms of its uh data i just have optimism and i feel like perhaps there will be some new future for us in this uh in this paradigm shift yeah, I, I don't just, why not have optimism? It, why not? Certainly Elsa doesn't himself. hurt. Right. I mean, it, if we consider it as inevitable as I propose, there's no point in not being optimistic because the only alternative is to just jump off a bridge. And, and I'm not saying anybody out there to, to do this, don't do that. Um, instead, take the take the perspective of, this could be an amazing opportunity. We simply have to prepare ourselves act accordingly. We have to situate a governing system that is uh, equitable, a wealth distribution system that is fair. Um, if we don't do these things, we're, we're in for some serious, serious trouble. Well, it's been, uh, it's been insightful. It's been interesting. It's been disturbing. And uh, we've covered a lot of ground. And like you said, at this point, this is kind of your swan song on talking about this because you have uh, been been pushing on this button for a while and nobody's listened. So maybe someone will listen to this. Swan song. That's a that's a great description. That's, it is. This is my swan song. I hope it was enjoyable and informative. And if you're interested in, in my perspective, just simply, you know, Google or YouTube my previous talks or uh and everything is out there and then do your own research um create your own analysis uh, i'd love to hear it send it to to jay or myself 
And thank you, Jay. Always a pleasure. Love talking to you.